The question of who rules America has been debated throughout America's own history. It was originally raised and answered to some degree by the American Revolution in the 1770s that fought for independence from the British crown so that Americans, at least some Americans, could rule themselves, or at least they hoped they could. We're, we're at Columbia University uh, with uh, Dr. Eric Foner, a historian and writer uh, and teacher uh, here at the university the for a long, long period rights, of time. Right to own property, I think right what to is own. unusual today is two things. One, the degree of inequality. Never before has the very, very top, the 1%, had so much of the national income and wealth in its own hands. And, uh, you know, so that the gap is greater than ever before. And secondly, um, you know, Occupy Wall Street is not primarily a movement as, of farmers, of laborers. It doesn't have the same base. People need to learn history. That's part of our job, to know that this issue has been around for a long time. There was nothing un-American about raising the question of economic plutocracy, economic inequality. It's as American as apple pie. And, um, you know, I think that the Occupy Wall Street people are you know, legitimate heirs of a long and venerable tradition in this country. Today, the activists of Occupy Wall Street are continuing the fight for independence and economic justice from domination by a small elite in the name of the majority, the 99% of America. I, I do think what's been brilliant about the Occupy Wall Street movement is the framing of the 1% versus the 99%. And I think, I think, I think what we basically have is an undemocratic power structure that goes across political, economic, social, and cultural lines. What kind of impact has Occupy Wall Street had in raising basic questions about the nature of power in America? We asked sociologist Stanley Aronowitz. It's had pers it has an impact on perception. It has changed the conversation. The question is whether or not it will be able to change policy. And the argument that I would make is that it should not worry about changing policy in the short run. The only way to change policy in the long run is going to be to create even a, a bigger movement. And in order to create that bigger movement, what it has to do is it has to ask the question, what kind of a life do we want to lead? What is the good life? What is the vision of the way in which we want to live? David DeGraw coined the 99% 1% phrase and was an early Occupy organizer. He explained why Who Rules America remains an urgent issue. So you have big banks and concentrated wealth that's just rigged the political process. Uh, you know, in investigating it, we have a country where U.S. millionaire households have $46 trillion of wealth. It's just a mind-boggling number. So, you know, over the past generation, all the wealth has gone to the top. You know, really it's one-tenth of one percent, more than one percent. But, uh, you know, breaking it down even further, you have 400 people who have as much wealth as 155 million Americans. So that's 400 people who have as much wealth as half the population. The seeds of a battle that many of the occupiers see as a new American revolution is not really new, but deeply rooted in the unresolved history of conflict in the United States between those who own and control its resources and those who want economic equality. So the question is, who rules America? And that's a funny question because then you talk about power. Uh, the first thing you have to understand is America is a business venture. Like, stolen land, stolen, stolen property, capitalism, and it's just about making money. You know, many revolutions start at the top. In other words, the people who began the struggle against Great Britain were merchants in Boston and New York plantation owners in Virginia. You know, most of the founders in Virginia are slave owners. But what happens is, as the struggle intensifies, they have to generate support among ordinary people. And when you do that, you break open the political system and you open the door for very, very different kinds of demands. Slaves start demanding their own freedom. Uh, women, Native Americans, start demanding greater equality. So what happens at the beginning when a you know, a, a more privileged class begins the resistance, uh, that doesn't necessarily tell you how the whole process is going to take place. 
this conflict between the 1%, actually the 0.001%, and the 99% had its echoes here in the home of America's anti-colonial uprising, in the back streets of Boston, where a freedom trail today commemorates a massacre by the British and a fight for liberty. And that's where we'll take you next. Was the American Revolution really a revolution? The British thought it was a revolution, no question about that. It, it was not a social upheaval in the way, let us say, the French Revolution was, but it certainly overthrew an entire system of government. It replaced the ruling class with another one, so that seems to be what a revolution is about. And it raised these questions of equality in the society. Not, not just equality in terms of 1% and 99%, but the role of slavery in American life, the status of women in American life. It unleashed a kind of um, uh, a struggle for equality among all sorts of groups, which continued long after the revolution was over. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. That's one of the most famous poems of the American Revolution. And here we are in front of the statue of Paul Revere, the man who alerted all of Massachusetts to the British troops coming into their communities. We're on the Freedom Trail in Boston where the American Revolution is remembered. But what kind of a revolution was it? What actually happened here in Boston back in the 1700s? What have we learned since then? Thousands of tourists and students visit these revolutionary monuments every day, but most have only a foggy idea of what really happened and tend to repeat the mythologies that are taught in their schools. Here was Paul Revere. Paul Revere was one of the great revolutionary heroes. Are you kids here to see the statue of Paul Revere? Yes, yes we are. We just yeah. Can I ask you a question about it? Sure. We're sure. doing a little TV program here. Yeah. Who was Paul Revere? What was this all about? Do you know? He, he was did a the founding midnight father. ride. Yeah, yeah. midnight ride. To warn about the British for coming. coming. Did you know that he was a very rich businessman, a yeah. silversmith yeah. here in Boston, and that yeah. uh, he wanted to be in the Continental Army and they wouldn't let him in? Did you know that? I didn't know, I that. Not know that. Did you know that in Boston there was this merchant class, you know, business leaders, the 1%, who were really running the whole show? Uh, in many ways, and that the people were not as involved because back then there were slaves, mm -hmm. there were indentured servants, uh, <laughs> there were a lot of people who didn't have a say in what was going on. Did you know about that? No yeah. idea. I didn't know anything about Paul Revere. <laughs> we would love to learn from him. Maybe you about the revolution. <laughs> I'm supposed to learn about it in history, but I don't think. My brother Bill here has taught history uh, to students in Massachusetts for many, many, many years and has followed, you know, the various debates about our history. What was it about this revolution? Uh, you know, was it a popular uprising or was it sort of led by elites here in Boston? Well, both were true. There were popular elements. Uh, ordinary people did resent the British. Uh, ordinary people did participate in riots and boycotts. Uh, but there was a 1% back then, uh, the leaders of the revolution, uh, both led it and channeled it. Uh, they were certainly not above using words like liberty and freedom uh, to deflect and distract people from their own discontents in the colonies. And their own interests. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the business class of Boston didn't want more taxes on their products. They wanted to compete with the British goods. They felt they, they shouldn't be taxed. And as a result, there was the tea, original Tea Party here in Boston. Right. And there were, uh, you know, merchants like uh, John Hancock, who was into smuggling goods. And you're right, they didn't want to pay British taxes. I mean, there were other factors behind the revolution as well. But when this revolution was codified in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention, the people who were invited were the large landowners, the slave owners, the merchant class, no women, no Indians, no blacks, no working people. Actually, there were slaves that were inspired by the revolution to try mm -hmm. to get their freedom. Mm -hmm. Some actually did. I think the idea of the revolution and the idea of democracy uh, were radical, inspiring, revolutionary uh, in ways that, that actually might have made the leaders uncomfortable since some of them themselves owned slaves. 
Uh, they, they, they really didn't want this to go viral in the way it, it did around the world. So who ruled America then? Mm -hmm. In a way, their grandchildren are, ru are ru ruling it today. And sometimes direct descendants of those people. So, uh, you know, I mean, there was a certain amount of class mobility, uh, indentured servitude disintegrated due to the chaos of the revolution. But I don't think the people who led the revolution really intended a social revolution. That was really not what they were thinking about. After the revolution, people like Daniel Shays in Western Massachusetts, a farmer, a captain in the revolution, uh, did try to um, inspire, organize another rebellion against those who he saw as replacing his British masters. This time, they were the colonial leaders. So here we are, 225 years after the Shays Rebellion rocked Western Massachusetts in a challenge to the 1% of those times. We have a memorial for Daniel Shays and the men who fought with him. And what's interesting is we have American flags being put in a sense almost at his tombstone here, marking support for the values and the aspirations that he fought for. My name is Dave Wildstein. We are at the Stagecoach Tavern in Western Massachusetts, town of Sheffield. And this painting is a painting of Daniel Shays' militiamen. Uh, Daniel Shays fought in the revolution. They came back from the revolution and found their farms being foreclosed and many put in prison because of the same debt crisis that we're experiencing now. Uh, there are many similarities, but essentially one of the promises of the revolution was to annul the foreign debt. And the farmers came home and discovered the debt was even greater and the banks were even tougher. Today, the Shays Rebellion is mostly forgotten, but it lives on on YouTube with songs and dramatic recreations. Shays now unsheathed his sword and ordered the fife and drum players to strike up a tune. The men began marching in cadence. The irony, says historian Eric Foner, is that Shays was just a front man for a mass movement. In fact, it was the opponents who said it's Shays' rebellion in order to find a kind of boogeyman, you know, they could attack. So let's forget about Shays as a person and think about the mass movement, the farmers, the ordinary laborers who took to the streets, shut down the courts, and said, wait a minute, we had a revolution we have installed a government that's supposed to represent the people here in Massachusetts, and yet it's talking, you know, it's the bankers and the landowners and the merchants who are getting the benefit of everything. It was the first Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, they petitioned the government in Boston for redress, and the government ignored the petitions. And they're having still had their arms, they went to these court sites and picketed to prevent the courts from sitting. Succeeded to some extent, until private militias were formed and the Massachusetts militias were formed to suppress it. It was suppressed right near here, the, right? The last battle was fought in Sheffield. It was led by Brigadier Ashley, who's, the Ashley house is still here. And Colonel Ashley, his parents, were one of the heroes of the revolution. So here we have the same family uh, uh, building independence, but then trying to suppress it. If many white Americans were disappointed by the achievements of the American Revolution, what about blacks and Native Americans? In 1730, when Sheffield was incorporated, there were 30 black families in Sheffield. Half were slaves, half were free. But the famous story is, again, at the Ashley House, one of the servants, Elizabeth Freeman, called Ma Betts, overheard all the talk about the Massachusetts Declaration of Independence at the dining table. And it occurred to her that maybe she might qualify. And she actually filed in the court of Great Barrington and won her freedom. So here you have the court giving freedom on one hand and suppressing freedom on the other. 
Years later, a small black community in the area that Daniel Shays made famous became the home of a young man who had become a leader of the fight for civil rights. He coupled concerns for racial equality with demands for economic justice. Today, in the center of his hometown of Great Barrington, Massachusetts, there's a wall mural celebrating his political and intellectual contributions. It includes quotes from President Barack Obama and Martin Luther King. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was one of the titan giants of the 20th century, although of course he's born in the 19th century. Du Bois put forward the issues which are still with us, the race issue in America. You know, he said in 1903, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It's still a problem in this country and around the world. Du Bois talked about economic equality and how to gain that, and he grappled with these questions. He's a brilliant writer, a brilliant thinker, and much of what he said is still relevant, uh, I think, to thinking about American society. What about Native Americans? They were the ones uh, to be eliminated as, because it was their land that was wanted, not even their labor. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is part of America's indigenous movements and says the people we call Indians were being exterminated. We asked her about the American Revolution. It wasn't a revolution, it was a war of independence from the, you know, the colonial overpower, but it wasn't an anti-colonial revolution like the Bolivarian revolutions in South America or the Haitian revolution. So there are many different, even competing narratives about the origins of the United States. The United States, of course, was founded as a settler state, as a colonial state, became an imperialist power. And uh, the democracy has always been uh, an oligarchic democracy, you know, a capitalist democracy with a rhetoric of, um, of uh, um, populism which is so strongly based on race. That is, if you're not, if you're not black, if you're not a slave, um, you're not indigenous, if you're white and a settler, then everyone could be a king, everyone can own land and be a landlord. So all these peasants who came as settlers, the dream is to be, you know, be the king of the hill. And uh, so it's a very, um, it's a very insidious kind of democracy because it's a it's a an illusion Illusion or not, this is a subject that needs to be examined if we are to understand who rules America, the origins of the 1% and then teach about it. So this is all part of the history that most Americans probably don't know. Did you find when you were teaching students here that many of them just didn't know much about their own history? I think there are many students that I taught uh, in one of the towns that fought at Concord who were never even in the spot we're standing in now. And I think that that's true, that, that many kids were not familiar with that history, and beyond what, local battlefields and so on. The other thing about the Revolutionary War, which is relevant to today because we live in a globalized world, mm -hmm. is that this revolution started locally here in Boston, but mm -hmm. soon the British were involved, the, the Dutch, mm -hmm. the French. Mm -hmm. It became a war of many different countries all fighting on mm -hmm. American soil. Well, very true, and the, the, the French intervention was, was very critical to our success. It wasn't all through the force and valor of our arms. Uh, there were other people involved. But I think the, you know, the idea itself has played a revolutionary role in history. But the idea itself did not create a deep social revolution in the United States. And to this day, people are distracted by um, words like liberty and freedom and justice uh, in the same way that they were back then. Ironically, the original Tea Party, which inspired the modern right-wing Tea Party movement today, was actually a protest against an earlier form of corporate imperialism. Why was tea the issue, not corn or whiskey or something like that? It was because the East India Company had gone bankrupt in China and the crown, the British crown, bailed them out so they wouldn't, you know, lose their, lose their assets. But then the crown looked around and said, well, what does the company have that we can sell? Well, it turned out what they had was tea. So they decided to market the tea. And that's why it was tea that was 
uh, the tax issue. So here you have a big financial failure, and the, the, it was global. The, the, uh, the uh, implications trip, rippled across the Pacific, rippled across the Atlantic, and we have the Boston Tea Party. Throughout our history, there have been sort of conspiracy theories about all of this. I mean, today, for example, both the right and the left seems to see the Federal Reserve Bank as sort of a, a conspiracy concocted in 1913 without any proper process and kind of running the show. Yeah, well, you know, conspiracy theories, conspiracy thinking is deeply embedded in our political culture. My PhD supervisor, my mentor, Richard Hofstetter, wrote the famous book in the 1960s, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, in which he traced out various kinds of conspiratorial thinking, uh, whether it was Catholics who were in the before the Civil War trying to undermine America, or, uh, you know, various other groups at various times, immigrants, others trying to, you know, destroy the American culture, uh, or the Trilateral Commission, remember them in the 1970s were supposedly ruling the whole world. Now the Federal Reserve, right, if we only abolish the Federal Reserve Bank, everything would go back to some utopia of the past. Throughout U.S. history, you see various right-wing movements point out scapegoats in the society, and they're usually the, the folks who are already marginalized in some way or another. And, and what happens is that there comes a moment when it becomes really useful for the elite powers, whether they're in government or corporations, to encourage these movements. So you get a Tea Party, or you get a militia movement like in the 90s, or you get the Ku Klux Klan in the 1800s. And what this is all about is taking angry, mostly white people who are mostly somewhat privileged and convincing them that they're about to fall down the social economic ladder. I guess the basic problem with conspiracy theories is that no group can fully determine what happens. Even people with great power launch things and then they kind of lose control of them and things happen in a way that is unpredictable. When you look back at history, mm -hmm. and, and you maybe can see, because of, you know, it's a long time ago, all mm -hmm. of these forces, mm -hmm. yet today, somehow, in the news, we never see these forces. What we see are politicians spouting various, uh, you know, rhetoric and speeches, but we don't really know whose interests they're serving, who's behind the scenes. Well, this is why we need research. We need, uh, we need an understanding of who rules America because the mythology today is that it is the people who rule America. And uh, most folks don't know a great deal in, in terms of specifics about the role that corporations play, um, the way politicians are tied to corporate interests. Change is possible. I think when one talks about who rules America and a power elite, one should not use that to simply fall into a kind of quietism and say, well, nothing is possible, no change is possible, everything's under control. Many of the major popular movements in our history have been big surprises, you know? Nobody expected them to come. And I think the same thing with Occupy Wall Street. Nobody expected Occupy Wall Street to come up simply, simply out of nowhere. And so I think, we, you know, we have seen that over and over again in our history, and we will continue to. People say the 1%, and, you know, we are the 99%. But, you know, when I broke down the numbers, it was really, it, it, it is a couple hundred people in this country that have immense wealth. If you look at, the, if you look at our election process, it's something like, uh, you know, one hundredth of 1% accounts for something like 80% of the campaign finance. I mean, that's insanity. I mean, it's completely, it's a rigged game. And now the ball of history has been passed to a new generation, fighting to transform a large and complex country with many power centers. But just as in the past, it is determined minorities who make the difference. An elite made the American Revolution, and as we will see, a power elite still rules. Coming up in the next episode of Who Rules America, how the military and the corporations took over. The people who rule America are um, the large corporate entities, uh, which are supranational. They have no loyalty to the nation state. Next time on Who Rules America.